Today, what we're going to talk about is the excitement around our own research and discovery, but also the infrastructure that's going to be offered in the Helix. And what we're really talking about is discovery in asthma and COPD, but as we leverage something called NJX. NJX is the New Jersey Alliance for Clinical and Translational Science. We are the only CTSA hub that's an NIH infrastructure grant uh, that got re-upped for another seven years, and our alliance partners our Rutgers is the home uh, institution, but Princeton, NJX, uh, NJIT, New Jersey Institute for Technology, as well as our health system, uh, the RWJ Barnabas Health System. So what we're going to be talking about is translational science, and that spans both T1 through T4. Now, what is that? Well, using the parlance of sort of big pharma, T0 is petri dish work, that's preclinical moving to humans, to patients, then ultimately to change policy. The traditional phase one through phase four is also demonstrated here with the specific, the very specific actions of proof of safety, proof of, well, proof of discovery, safety, and then efficacy to proof of acceptance. Now, NJX, the New Jersey Alliance for Clinical and Translational Scientists, will reside in the fourth floor of the Helix building, and it is disease agnostic. That is, we serve everyone to provide the infrastructure that encompasses translational science. So I'm going to be talking today about our science in the T0, T1 space. Now, in order for us to do um, nimble discovery in the lungs, we developed a model some 15, 18 years ago where we actually get human lungs shipped to us. These human lungs are aborted lung transplant. Donors had catastrophic brain and heart injury. What we do is we take the lungs, we inflate them, we then section them, core them, and ultimately, down here, you can actually see a small airway. That small airway constricts and relaxes to therapies or mediators. This is a model where we get 700 slices, and we can do moderate throughput in a variety of ways. Now, out of these lungs, we also derive primary human cell lines. These are primary. They're not... Uh, they're not immortalized, they retain a phenotype of the disease. And the three major cell lines that we have are airway epithelium, smooth muscle, and lung fibroblasts. Now, if we think about challenges in asthma and COPD, and by the way, about one in 20 of the US population has asthma, incredibly common. COPD is the fifth largest killer of Americans in the United States. What we know is the bronchodilator market is quite substantial, about $42.5 billion in 2026, and it's increasing because the prevalence of these diseases are increasing. Current bronchodilators, though, have not stayed up with the need. They're great, and you watch them on television, they come uh, via a meter dose inhaler that opens up the airways, but guess what? We have not had a new bronchodilator in 40 years. 40 years. Well, you could say, well, Panitari, there's no need. They're working well. Not true. Matter of fact, it's all about context. If you use your rescue inhaler too often, guess what? It no longer works because you get tolerance or beta 2 adrenergic receptor tachyphylaxis. Inflammatory mediators render the efficacy of these drugs in half. Not a great bronchodilator. Other inflammatory mediators engender hyporesponsiveness, and RV infections, that rhinovirus, one of the most common causes for asthma exacerbation, actually makes the rescue inhaler not work. So we need new bronchodilators. What we have discovered is this pathway is actually very relevant for airway smooth muscle relaxation. If you relax your smooth muscle, chest tightness, cough, and wheeze goes away 
in asthma and COPD. Now, the beta-2 adrenergic receptor, this is how most beta agonists work, increase cyclic AMP. And if you go way back into your pharmacology history, how is cyclic AMP broken down? Oh, it's broken down by phosphodiesterases that degrade the cyclic AMP to AMP and phosphate. That's how you turn it off. Well, what's interesting is this pathway is very effective in decreasing contraction pathways on this side. But what we discovered is the major pathway by which cyclic AMP goes down in airway smooth muscle is not through phosphodiesterase degradation, but through loss out through a pore into the extracellular space called ABCC1. This is novel and new. Using this idea, we did a crazy experiment. We said, hey, let's measure cyclic AMP levels in the blood as a biomarker. If you have too much cyclic AMP in your blood, it means your bronchodilator effect is going to be attenuated. And we also discovered over here a new target that could actually serve as a bronchodilator. So that crazy idea led to a JCI paper where what we show, what we show is patients with asthma have higher levels of cyclic AMP in their blood. It shouldn't be there. If it's in the cytosol of the cell, it's acting to bronchodilate. But what we found, and this is a log scale here, is that those patients with asthma have higher cyclic AMP in their blood. Aha! The aha moment is this could be a point of care test using a finger stick to A, diagnose the disease and potentially predict therapeutic response. But we needed to also understand new bronchodilators. So we took those primary cell lines, we plated them in 96 wells, and what you're looking at is a constriction of one cell in response to a contractile agonist, called a mediator. That allowed us a model to try to block the Maltese cross development. And what we demonstrated is a new inhibitor very upstream in this pathway that has nothing to do with beta agonists can actually bronchodilate or relax the muscle to a greater extent, or actually to a comparable extent to the standard, industry standard for Motorol beta agonists. That's a gee whiz. So what we were able to do is use human cells in human tissue to screen compounds to identify a new therapeutic target. That's what academics actually does very well. So what we've now done is not only looked at this G-alpha-12 antagonist up at the top, but in this pathway, we've discovered other drugs that could block the contraction, shortening, of airway smooth muscle that has nothing to do with beta agonists and not plagued by the context that I showed you before. So what I showed you is a way that translational scientists using human systems can actually discover targets that could be implemented. Now, what I want to do now is transition. So how does NJX help investigators? Well, here you can see that our, our program, the Rutgers Institute for Translational Medicine and Science, actually interfaces with virtually every school in Rutgers Health, as well as NJIT and Princeton. So this is truly a statewide process. What is our theme? Our theme is simple. We want to understand the heterogeneity of disease and the heterogeneity of response to therapy. So what does that mean? That means if you have diabetes or congestive heart failure, it's not one disease. It's myriad diseases encompassed by that term. So, follow me. If one has a heterogeneous disease and have a new diagnostic tool, like the cyclic AMP blood biomarker tool, I can refine my definition in predicting therapeutic response to an individual person. Well, that's great. But what you may not know is when you take a pill, your response to that pill 
regardless of the disease state, is unique. And there's heterogeneity of response to every medication you take. So you take heterogeneity of disease process and heterogeneity of response to therapy, and you collide the two. It's amazing that we get any drugs to work because of the uniqueness of the individual, their response to therapy, and the disease entity. Well, there's more bad news. If you take all that into account and you're going to change physician behavior, you have to get payers to agree to take, uh, pay for the medicine. You have to have patients who are willing to pay for the medicine and take the medicine. So it's a really complicated pathway. What we have done is taken this incredibly complicated pathway and boiled it down to four principles. The show principles, that is, if I can get it to move, streamline the process of developing IRB protocols, getting clinical protocols approved, harmonize our approach, orchestrate an infrastructure that can move the discovery into patients quickly and to wonder, wonder how we can do it better. So with that, this program is really comprehensive in nature, can't cover all the details, but each and every one of these cores are disease agnostic. We can provide biostatistical support. We can provide regulatory support. We can provide develop, career development opportunities based on this platform. It's very effective in generating new translational products to market. So what did we do in the, last, in the last five years? Well, we took our EHR, which is the Robert Wood Johnson Barnabas Health System EHR. It has a total of 7 million uh, individual patients, but 4.4 million are actually active patients. We have established a mirror database that allows investigators to query that for real world evidence studies. We've also used it for a variety of other purposes I'll cover. We have a very robust pilot program. We do micro-credentialing and badging where people can de demonstrate competence to a particular activity like research coordination uh, or commercialization of academic assets. We foster a network of networks to work in the community with community-based organizations. We have a biomarker core, a clinical trials office core I'm going to touch on, and we provide career development, case series grants for early stage investigators, as well as pre- and postdoc trainees. Now, our concept is we take discovery, we move it to practice, and then on the policy by linking databases, very large databases. Some are these bioinformatic databases as well as CMS and payer databases. Down here, what we have is an approach for DNI science or dissemination and implementation. Remember how long it takes to get a discovery to the provider to change behavior? Does anyone know how long that is? Can't see anybody, but it's 17 years. 17 years when your widget has been discovered before it gets taken up by a provider. That is horrible. So what we have developed is a clinical trials office. You want to do a clinical trial? You come here. Rutgers can get a clinical trial stood up, a new clinical trial stood up in 45 days from the signing of a CDA to first patient visit. That competes within the private space. How do we do that? We harmonized and orchestrated the entire process. So what we do is we have a study team that works within our clinical trials management system, Encore Enterprise. We have an approach that can find patients in our health system matched by inclusion-exclusion criteria using structured and unstructured data, using AI natural language processing, of reading the provider's notes, as well as ICD-10 codes. From that, I can determine exactly how many patients we have in our health system that qualify for your study. So, do we do all the studies that we can? No. Sometimes we just don't have the patients to match. But we can kill a study before we expend time, effort, and resources. Better to know Rutgers can't deliver 
than to overpromise and underdeliver. We then unified and centralized all the processes, contracts, budget negotiations under one office. Now, what we are excited about is the Helix building. You've seen this picture ad nauseum, I'm sure. Uh, some of it you haven't seen. This is uh, the building from a variety of phases. Uh, we are going to reside on the fourth floor. That The incubator space is up at the top, right underneath the vivarium there. And our goal in the development of this space was to marry dry lab and wet lab into neighborhoods. So each of the translational science floors will have a program. That program has to have a robust dry lab and wet lab together. These so-called neighborhoods, there's two neighborhoods on each of the three floors, can uh, support many, many investigators, both at the wet lab side and in the dry lab side. These are the dry labs, that, uh, wet labs, uh, the dry lab space associated with the wet labs. So with that, thank you.